black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. And I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was he was he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Yeah. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight and actually for the next couple days. I figure it's the holiday season. Uh, Let's pump out some shows. I know some people are going through some tough times this time of year, and it's not easy for everyone. I know for some people, it's a great time of year. You get to spend it with family and friends, but I know there's a lot of people out there who who don't have that. And, uh, you know, if you use this show as an outlet, as a chance to uh, take your mind off things, sit back, relax, I got you tonight, and I got you for the next couple nights. I'm going to be bringing uh, Thomas Seawood on the show. And Thomas was actually born in uh, British Columbia in Alert, off Alert Bay. Thomas is a great guy because he grew up as a commercial fisherman. And he's First Nations. He was taught about Sasquatch. He has a lot of historical accounts. He has his own personal encounters. Uh, and he, I know he spent many, many years, as him and I spoke uh, the other night, he spent many years living out in the bush and being a modern-day bushman. And so he's looking at these encounters, and he's been looking for these very, as Thomas would say, uh, very large and small hair-covered creatures uh, that visitors and homesteaders would talk about. But Thomas has his own encounters, very compelling encounters. I know these days Thomas uh, is assisting his common-law wife, Peggy. He's actually up in Kent, Washington right now, uh, and they're running a uh, adventure tourism uh, called Hamumu Adventures. And if you go to www.hamumuadventures.com, it's a lot like how it sounds, H-A-Mumuadventures.com. They're starting to do uh, uh, sea kayak and yacht-based uh, tours and kind of guiding it towards Sasquatch-related, going out to different areas and and working on these different tours. But again, you can check it out at hamumuadventures.com. If you want to contact uh, Thomas, Thomas has some beautiful First Nations artwork that he he creates. Uh, And you can check it out on his Facebook. If you go to Thomas Seawood uh, on Facebook, his last name is S-E-W-I-D. You can check out some of his artwork. I actually plan on buying some of it. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful stuff. And Thomas is one of those guys, uh, one in a million, where you come across him and you start talking with him. And it's just amazing to hear some of his knowledge, some of his his encounters, and some of his ideas uh, from a, a First Nations perspective regarding Sasquatch. Uh, so he'll be coming up here in a moment. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. And let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Tom to the show. Tom, thanks for coming on tonight, man. I appreciate you being here and sharing some of the First Nation stories. Thank you for coming on tonight. Thank you for having me on the show. Greetings in my language. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. Tom, if you would kind of talk about the First Nations perspective regarding Sasquatch. 
I'm a member of the Kwakwakiwak First Nation, otherwise known as a tribe, which is made up of 18 smaller tribes with their own names, their own territories. But our territories encompass northwestern Vancouver Island at the Brooks Peninsula, all the way out across the top end of Vancouver Island to the mainland to a place known as Smith's Inlet, and then all the way southwards to Campbell River on Vancouver Island, across to the mainland to the north side of Butte Inlet. It's a pretty vast territory and made up, of course, northern Vancouver Island and then the islands that are in between Vancouver Island and the mainland where all the inlets and rivers are. And one of the most famous places is the Broughton Archipelago, which is off northeastern Vancouver Island, uh, Telegraph Cove, which is the orca whale and grizzly bear viewing hub for summer and fall is up in that area and my tribe the Mamliacha, our territories are right there in the western entrance of the Broughton Archipelago but I was born in Alert Bay which is a small island in that area which is pretty famous uh, it has uh, the Numgis tribe lives there and the world's tallest totem pole um, it's the cultural center with beautiful carvings and totem poles and the village itself has totem poles all throughout it and in the graveyard. And as a kid growing up there, we used to go up to the ceremonial big house up on the hill in the shadow of the world's tallest totem pole. And we'd go up there for the great celebrations known as potlatch, which are still held to this day. And they're basically just when a family has a celebration for marriage, maybe they had a good bountiful fishing season over the last few years or maybe it's a memorial potlatch for someone who'd passed away and other family members but at these potlatches they open up what we call a gildas the symbolic box of treasure a family and chief holds title to and from that symbolic box of treasure they bring forth their crests which have legends and stories so just for an example most families have title to the chunahua which is the wild woman of the woods, supposed to be taller than a man, covered in hair. She's active at night, and at times you can hear her calling from island to island with her whoop, whoop, whoop. And if you come across her, you'll see her usually in daytime because you're human, you can't see at night. And if you come across her, she'll get startled and jump up because she's usually sleeping. And she'll rub her eyes and yawn, and then she'll just disappear into the forest, into her home. But the Junachua is uh, the most valuable crest to ever have. And we've acquired our crest through marriages through thousands of years. And chiefs in the old times would pay huge dowries, astronomical dowries, for the right to get the Junachua crest. And just so a lot of people have a good, clear understanding, we do have a male version of the Junachua. And it's the same kind of face with puckered up lips and sleepy looking eyes and long hair and the only difference from the female one that you see danced is it has a mustache and that male Jonah was so I guess you could say sacred and powerful that the only time you actually see it is in a potlatch in a big house when they put it on the face of a man who has held a memorial potlatch for a chief or his father within his family. And when they put that mask on his face, it's part of the process to make that final step to be referred to as a hereditary chief. And uh, so a lot of people get mixed up when they hear wild woman of the woods, Chunahua. Well, yeah, it's referring to what Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin's filmed in Bluff Creek, a female Sasquatch. But the male one is so sacred that you only see it certain times of the year if there's a potlatch. So now that we know that the Junoch was the Kwakwakiwak people's version of Sasquatch, Bigfoot, when you're a kid growing up, you know, you're acting up, you're misbehaving, you might be whining and just being a brat. Well, the elders, even nowadays, I do it with my kids when they're younger. You tell them, you behave yourself, because that Chonahua, the wild woman of the woods, she's watching you from the forest. And she's not allowed to touch you, children, what we call Kinganatum. She's forbidden to touch the Kinganatum so long as they behave. But if you misbehave and you're a whiner, you don't listen to your elders, 
you're lazy, you don't do your chores, the Junachua has rights to come at nighttime and she's going to shove her big hairy arm through the window or through the wall of the house or through the tent and she's going to grab the bad child, shove them into her spruce root sack, it's sort of like a potato sack made from the fibers of the spruce tree's roots and she's going to throw that spoiled rotten screaming kid in there throw the sack on her back and she's going to run deep into the forest up into the high mountains to where her invisible home is and that's where she boils up and eats the bad children and that's just the version that i was brought up with as a young boy in alert bay and later on on other parts of vancouver island and even my kids I, you know a few years back when they were young and we were doing running our tourism business out on Village Island in the Broughton Archipelago. My kids acted up. I didn't hesitate to tell them the story about the Junahua. It's our form of the boogeyman, I guess, but it sure works. Keeps the kids in line. <laughs> yeah, and as you and I were talking the other night, uh, for people here in the, uh, and we'll get to some of the encounters and historical accounts, Tom, but uh, for the audience listening, I know here in the Pacific Northwest, most people will know this, especially in Washington State, uh, Chief Aluska. And when I was a kid, I was telling you the other night, uh, probably in kindergarten, we went up to see Chief Aluska. And I, I, you know, I didn't know it was a Sasquatch they were talking about, but it, it absolutely terrified me. It was the wild woman of, of, of the forest. And I always assumed they were talking about some crazy Native American woman. Uh, I had no <laughs> idea they were actually talking about Sasquatch. But they did, you know, they had the fire and Chief Aluska, that guy knew how to put on a show. I don't care what anyone says. That guy really knew how to put on a show. And they had the fire going and they had the drums going. And then they had the wild woman of the the woods come in and it would dance around. And at the last moment, and I don't even know how Chief Aluska did this, but I don't know if the lights went out or if fire blew up or, or what. But uh, the, the person dancing in the mask uh, would reach out to try and grab one of the children and Chief Aluska was telling the story about how uh, she would take children and eat them. And, I, and you know, Chief Aluska was a giant when I was a kid. I'm sure I'm a big man now, but I'm sure if he was still alive today, he'd still be a big man in my eyes. But I remember how much that just terrified me. I mean, it really, it stuck with me my whole life. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago uh, where I thought, after getting into the Sasquatch field, I, I thought, oh, that's what he was talking about. Yeah. Well, I was, when you mentioned it the other night when we were talking, I was really honored and touched because my family, the Seawood family, my grandfather was uh, late chief James All Seawood, and he's pretty famous back in the day and even nowadays. A lot of people uh, my age and older know about him because he wrote a book called Guests Never Leave Hungry, and it's still in print. It tells about our way of life. But when he was living in Alert Bay and I was a young boy up there, I remember in uh, I guess that would probably be late 60s, early 70s, when Luska, I can't remember what his first name was now, but anyway, he showed up with his family to Alert Bay and they explained to my grandfather that he was of Cherokee descent, I believe, but he started sharing with my grandfather stories that about the Kwakwakiwak people and stuff that isn't written in the history books or back then on TV. And still, even to this day, not even on the internet. And it really amazed my grandfather. And he spoke about how he believed this uh, Chief Laluska, but he explained how he believed he was reincarnated from a Kwakwakiwak chief. Well, my grandfather, he was a very devout Anglican Christian. He was a lay minister, and but he was also a hereditary chief. Where I'd see him in his robes on Sunday morning in the church and that afternoon evening I'd see him in the big house in traditional button blanket regalia his kulus headpiece which is like a eagle thunderbird and his talking stick so he lived the parallel existence but you got to remember being a Christian like that and someone talking about reincarnation you know it's sort of you know, I guess you can say blasphemy some people look at it like that but my grandfather loaded him up on his fish boat and took him out to the abandoned native villages and Luska just started telling stories like he'd been there. So my grandfather was so enthralled at this that he adopted Luska and his family into our family, and he actually gave him the name Luska. It comes from my family's Gildas, our box of treasure of names. And he gave 
Chief Leluska the right to use the Siwadik Ildis, our symbolic box of treasure. And that's when he came back south down here to Ariel, Washington. And him and his family toiled away and they built this ceremonial big house and some carvings and they created the masks and the next thing you know they did what we say in our language noosa they shared the stories with people from all over the pacific northwest and all over the world and me and my common law wife peggy who lives here in kent washington and that's where i'm at right now at her place but we went down there this summer and i hadn't been there since i was 14 years old and it was brought back a lot of memories but at the same turn i was thinking about, wow, the Seawood family of all the Kwakwakiwak families, millions of people in the world know about our box of treasure and how many people have witnessed the Animal Kingdom dances and the Sasquatch, the Chonakwa dance that Leluska and his family did for decades. And now with Leluska's passing, his younger brother, I believe, Smitty is his name, He's carrying it on with the rest of the family members. So it's quite an honor for my family to have that have taken place since the early 1970s. Yeah, no, it, it's a fond memory of mine. And gosh, I couldn't have been more than six years old when I saw it. And I can still remember it like I was there yesterday. I can almost tell you exactly what the lodge smelled like. I can tell you the feeling in the air. And I almost I can tell you step by step the dance that the wild woman did and um, I can still picture Chief Aluska in my head, and the, he was a giant, or maybe it's just because I remember him because I was a six, but uh, looking back, I just remember him just being a giant of a guy, just a huge guy, and just a real intimidating guy. It's super nice, but I mean physically oh, intimidating. He was a big man. He was. Uh, he must have been pushing 500 pounds. Oh, at least. At all at that, as well as being big all around. He used to put a block of cedar on his shoulder about lunchtime and with the uh, ads which is a uh, sort of an elbow shaped wood handle with a metal blade he'd start pounding away on his left shoulder with his ads and then at dinner time when we all sat down he'd be there and I always remember he had those big bottles of coca-cola at the head of the table where he sat and we'd eat our dinner and then after dinner he'd sit down with that block of wood that he was working on for the afternoon and he'd start painting it and by the time we went to bed he had a complete cedar Kwakwaki walk styled mask complete. He was just amazing, just a genius when it came to the art. And people can still go there. When I was there, I was just amazed at the museum. And outside, he's got that beautiful big Junahua welcoming pole with outstretched arms. And on top of her is a bird, and that's Kulus. That's cousin to the Thunderbird. That is the Siwadi family's New Yum, our first ancestor. That's where we come from, from the Kulus. And that's what that pole represents it. Chief Leluska's place. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I remember that pole, too. I remember the totem pole out front. Uh, would you mind telling the story about your encounter? I was impressed with it the other night when you and I were talking about when you actually had one in your rifle sight. If you wouldn't mind kind of starting from the beginning for the audience and, and telling that <laughs> encounter as far as what you ran into and and uh, what happened with that encounter. Well, it happened on an island called Village Island in a bay behind the village known as Native Anchorage. But that Village Island has a very famous village site known on the charts and history books as Mama Lala Kula, Village of Alaska Potlatch. Hardly the truth, because we still potlatch to this day. It was just the site of a potlatch that took place in 1920 that would see 26 of our people sent to prison for breaking the anti-potlatch laws. But the village itself has been abandoned since 1969, and there used to be, up until a few years ago, because they're all deteriorated now, old totem poles lying on the ground. There's still the remains of a traditional style gyuxi, a big house, big huge cedar beams and timber posts standing. And tourists would go to this village site because of all the books written about it, totem poles and tea, a curve of time, seven knot summers, and the list goes on. And in 1988, the chief and council sent me in as the Mamliacha tribe's watchman and caretaker of this village site. So I went in and we brought in a 26-foot trailer and we put it in native anchorage and built a little 10 by 10 foot addition on it. And we had speedboats. That's the only way we'd get around. And we lived out there in the summer months. 
cleaning the village up with weed eaters, removing the boards with rusty nails and broken glass, and other things, and just opening it up so kayakers and yachters and coming in their dinghies and even helicopters at one point, people could see all this beautiful remains of the history of our people and our village. And we lived in the trailer and nothing really happened until, I guess, 1991. And we'd uh, shut the camp down in end of August. And, you know, we're young, you know, in our 20s. And we went to Vancouver Island. And of course, we partied a little bit too long and too hard. And all of a sudden, the first part of October came about. And I told my friend who helped me out there, Trevor, who's a bushman from central British Columbia, I said, come on, we better go out there and get all that stuff out of the trailer, food and guns, equipment that we need. We didn't want it stolen. And when we went there, I went up the, from the beach with a box of groceries, and Trevor had a D-cell battery to put on the towing tongue of the trailer where the 12-volt battery should go. We brought it in all charged up. When I walked into the kitchen part of that trailer where the trailer hitch is outside the window, I'm seeing Trevor walk, and all of a sudden he just stood bolt upright, dropped that D-cell battery, turned and ran for the kitchen door. Well, being a bush busher, bush trained, you know, you don't sit around and ask questions. I ran straight to the far end of the trailer, and I grabbed the shotgun that was under the mattress, and I come back into the kitchen area, ran into Trevor, and I go, what was it? He goes, come look, come look. So we ran out to where the trailer hitch was and his D-cell battery lying on its side, and all you could hear was this crashing in the forest. So I looked at Trevor. I said, come on, let's go look. And he was kind of hesitant. So we walked around a bit, didn't see anything out of the ordinary. But I could pick up a little bit of a bad smell. So I didn't want to pry. So I just, you know, because number one, I didn't want to get shit scared if he told me that it was a Sasquatch. So I just, oh, okay, it's not around. Let's go back to the trailer. That night, he's sleeping where the table is it's a uh, bed and he had three windows around him and he always he had these blinds on there and I used to always tell him Trevor put your blinds down I want don't want Junoha looking at me at night when I'm trying to sleep and he'd laugh and he'd say ah, you don't have to worry about that he'd leave the blinds up well that night I'm lying in my bed at the opposite end of the trailer reading my book by candlelight and I look down the trailer there's Trevor snoring away and all three blinds are closed I thought that was kind of odd. And so I just reached over to my left, made sure my gun was there. You know, it's bush instinct to do that. Went to sleep. And then hours later, I woke up. And here Trevor is sleeping in the hallway by the outside the bathroom door, snoring away. So I thought, boy, something sure scared him. Next morning, we moved everything down to the beach. And this big boat came in. And we used my speedboat to shuttle everything out to the big boat called Gekame. It's the whale watch boat out of Telegraph Cove, old wood one. And we loaded up his deck. We put my speedboat under tow and we said goodbye to Village Island and Captain Jim Borum and started heading back to Vancouver Island. And me and Trevor sat on the hatch covers to have a cigarette and just looking at the trailer going, disappearing behind us. And Trevor looked at me and goes, that wasn't a goddamn bear, Tommy. And don't tell me it was a deer. He goes, whatever it was, it jumped up, it was black, and it ran on two bloody legs, and it went fast. I said, it was a big fella, Sasquatch? He goes, I can't, I've never seen one, I can't say, but that was no bear, because it was running on two legs. And We just sort of brushed it off and left it at that. And then two years later, roughly, I was captaining a commercial salmon seine boat, and we'd fished the entire coast for the summer sockeye and pink salmon season, and we call it a September closure where we shut down in southern British Columbia. We don't fish at all, really. And uh, the first opening for chum salmon in eastern Vancouver Islands north is the first week of October. So at that time, I had this girlfriend named Jojo and a native crewman named Dean. And he was from central British Columbia, Carrier First Nation. And Trevor, who was with me a couple of years prior. So we went up a few days before the opening started and we went to Village Island and we anchored out in Native Anchorage just off of where my trailer is. And we went out crab fishing. We had, you know, probably 50, 60 crabs when we go crab fishing. We get lots. And uh, we're just enjoying uh, Indian summer, waiting for the opening in a few days. And that night, just as it was getting dark, Trevor and Jojo were in a galley playing crib and they had a 
set player playing, but not too loud. And Trevor was out of cigarettes as usual. And they were playing crib and arguing away. And me and Dean were standing on deck having our cigarette and propane stove was on the hatch covers and we're cooking a bunch of crabs. And all of a sudden, this I guess it's probably 45 minutes to an hour after dark, we could see the trailer. Moon was out, a little bit of cloud, not much, just wispy clouds. It was almost half tide and rising because of the summer being over. All the driftwood was all bleached gray, so it was really lit up. You could really see in that bay, and there was no wind. We were just sitting there enjoying the night, and all of a sudden it sounded like someone hit the side of the trailer, like someone hitting it with their hand or something. And right away I thought to myself, gee, what the hell was that? branch falling out of a tree, um, maybe one of the metal kerosene empty cans under the trailer. Then I thought about that, and I said, no, we removed those things last year. And I'm just running through my memory bank, you know, what the hell was that noise? And all of a sudden, you just heard this. <laughs> and boy, the hair in the back of your neck just stands right up. And I was like, holy shit. And Dean sort of leaned forward. He's got his foot up in the bulwark. He's leaning in looking, because now we've heard the bang we've now heard that whistle chirping and my memory banks are going what the hell is that cougar fart bird mink fighting nope 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 it's not that i'm trying to think what the hell's that noise and then you distinctly saw two big upright shadows walk in front of that trailer on the beach and it wasn't no more than maybe 100 and under 150 yards from us and then all of a sudden wall is yachwala big stink just rank it's like I, people ask me what does it smell like and i go well you know when you're in the city and those street people with a shopping cart pass you and they haven't bathed in who knows how long and you smell that rotten stink body odor of a human especially a white guy because they're worse than indians and <laughs> all of a sudden everyone will look at me and they go yeah and i go well that smell 10 20 times worse that's the smell we got and almost once once has you gagging so now I pretty much know what the hell's on the beach. It's the big fellas. So I go into the galley door and open the galley door up. And I'm like, Jojo, turn that music off. I said, we got something on the beach. Come listen. And I said, be quiet, though. So I went back to where Dean was on my port bulwark or on my starboard bulwark. And we're looking towards the trailer. And you can't see anything other than the trailer and the moonlight. And Jojo and Trevor come out. And Trevor just asked Jojo for a cigarette. And just before this all happened, and you hear Jojo nagging away at him about always being out of smoke, spending all his money in the strip joint and that. Anyway, Trevor comes out, and he's got a cigarette going halfway through, and he goes, what's going on, Tom? And then all of a sudden, you heard that chirping again, but louder, and it's a little bit closer to where we are on the boat because it's walked down from the trailer a bit to the point. Trevor just looks at me and he stutters and he's like, whoa, 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 what the f f fuck was that? And I said, what do you think it was, Trevor? It's our friend from two years ago, the big fella is on the beach. Trevor flicked what was remaining of his cigarette and it was not even half gone. He flicked it overboard. He went through the galley door, down the engine room, heard the door slam because it's a big steel door in the forecastle, and that's it. We didn't see Trevor again. He was that scared of what was on the beach. You know, our curiosity is up, so I'm like, Jojo goes to me, she goes, boy, the beach stinks. And Dean, who grew up with her on one of the Gulf Islands, which you guys call San Juans, they used to clam dig as teenagers to make money. Dean looked at Jojo and said, Josie, when have you ever smelled the beach? That stink. Besides that, it's almost high tide. And right away, Jojo goes, Tom, what is it? And I said, we've got Chonahua, big fellas are on the beach. She goes, no way. I said, you heard it. I said, you're smelling it. I said, they're on there. And she goes, you sure? I said, I'm positive. And I go, hey, Dean. I said, let's put the spotlight on. He goes, yeah, okay. And you got to remember a commercial salmon fishbowl. You got a big ass spotlight. So I go out through the galley with Jojo. We get to the wheelhouse, windows, of course, on it and a side door on the starboard side. Dean walks up along the side of the cabin, gets to the pilot house door. And I well, I'm moving the spotlight, and he's looking up just to see because we don't have it on yet. I said, let's set it up so it's roughly in the area where I need to point it. So he's looking up, and he goes down a bit and over this way, and that's good there. And then I put my hand on the switch, and I go, okay, guys, get ready. Three, two, one, click. 
as soon as I hit that spotlight standing just one in the grass above high tide and one below the high tide mark on the smooth uh, lichen covered so they're nice and lit up in the moonlight are two creatures and the one in the grass is bigger and it has dropped to its knee it lifted its arm up in front of its face the one that was a little bit smaller on the further down the beach it, it had its back to us it dropped on its knees in a fetal position with its head covered with its hands and then we're like holy shit and we've got the spotlight right on him and we know damn well what we're seeing and i'm like jesus christ you guys look at that and you could see that one kneeling you could see two eyes reflecting and then one one and a half two eyes reflecting like when it's breathing and its arms moving and the one that's got its ass pointing to us on its knees on the beach you could see one eye under its right arm it was looking back at the boat first thing we're just amazed and enthralled i couldn't believe what i was seeing but you know it's quite a distance couldn't really see now i want to get these things moving so i go out in the bow and i'm yelling go on get out of here and waving my arms nothing of course they just stayed frozen so i get back inside and then that's when i had the thought hey that's a lottery ticket on the beach there times two with my name on it and the winning numbers so i went into my captain's quarters and i grab my 300 savage and i come out and i go dean you brought a gun on board yesterday go grab it and he goes yeah okay so he runs downstairs and he comes back up and he's outside the door and he pulls his gun out of his case takes a kneeling position with the gun resting on the rail of the bulwark and i look at it and it's got a scope which you know i'm not really impressed with because I, at that time i wasn't a scope hunter i'm an iron sighter and uh, i get my gun out starboard side window of the pilot house and i'm lining up and i got my cross my iron sight on it spotlight still on and then jojo goes tom you know the stories don't shoot it don't shoot it i said what do you mean i said we're just gonna whack one of them i said drag it out to the boat and throw it at ice downstairs after the opening i'll go sell it to someone i said that's millions of dollars standing there i said shitty fishing season we need money Jojo's, no, Tom, you know the stories from your people, the curse. If you harm or disrespect or kill a big fella, Sasquatch, if nothing happens to you bad, something will happen to the family and loved ones around you. And I started thinking about that. And then I looked at Dean. I said, Dean, what caliber is that gun of yours? Because I didn't know. And he looked at, he just he's looking through his sights still. He goes, it's a 243. And I said, where are you aiming for? And he goes, well, I'm aiming for the neck just below the chin. And I said, well, I got it on the sternum below chin. And I'm thinking about it, me having a 300 Savage iron sight, him with a 243 pop gun. And I'm like, how is this, Dean? Barrel up, barrel up, barrel up. So he pulls his barrel up. I said, we're not shooting that thing. I said, uh, too big. Meanwhile, I was thinking about the curse. And I know what my father brought me up. He always told me, don't you ever harm them. You know, you see them, you respect them. Don't you ever hurt them. Bad's going to happen to you or your loved ones. Besides that, we got to respect them. So right away, you know, excitement at the moment, you know, seeing a million bucks standing there in your spotlight gets a hold of you. But, you know, once you start thinking about it, your frontal lobe kicks in and you put barrels up. You don't squeeze the trigger. And I'm glad I didn't. So we put the guns away and now we've got close to 20 minutes or more have passed by and, as a captain, I'm thinking, you know, my boat's old, 1927. Who knows how old those batteries are because it's a company boat. And I thought, oh, I better turn the spotlight off. So I shut it off. I didn't want my batteries to die because I had to get the hell out of there. I wanted that motor to start. Those things were big. And then all of a sudden, you just heard like two humans walking, but walking deliberately, quietly. And then all of a sudden, you heard the parting of the branches above the grass and which is hemlock and cedars and then you could hear a crack and another crack and you knew they were walking off the beach or in the bush and all of a sudden you heard the sound of a rotten big hemlock or whatever in the bush being pushed down just that big soft rotten wood crunching crashing both and then they disappeared that was it and we started the motor jojo went to bed and sleep slept me and Dean went up on the bridge and we were just sitting there smoking cigarettes, BSing away about what just happened, you know, how amazing it was. <clears throat> and after about 
an hour with the battery running or motor running to charge your batteries back up. I opened the skylight and I hollered to Trevor, shut the motor off. So he shut it off. Like I say, he wouldn't come out on deck. He just stayed down there. He shut the motor off and me and Dean just stood up and sat up on the bridge listening. And it wasn't 20 minutes after the motor was off. You heard that quack, quack, quack. One of those blue herons fly out of the head of the bay where the stream is in that anchorage and something spooked it. And then we heard that thing walking down the boulders of that stream, not in the soft sands, but in the boulders. And we put the spotlight on it again, but all we got was eye reflection and a rough shadow. And when we turned the spotlight off, you could hear it, its feet going through the mud. It was at the, on the beach and it disappeared again. So we just sat there. And then that's when we saw a silhouette of a shoulders and head come up from behind a rock about 60, 70 yards from the port side of the boat because we're on, it's come around the bay now. It's checking us out. And that's when I started to feel really uneasy because now the table's turned. We're now being stalked. We're now being watched. And you can distinctly hear that thing sucking in with its nose, scenting us. You just hear this big, long, drawn-in breath being taken. It went into the bush. You could hear it cracking a little bit, but really quiet for its size. Then it came out on the beach again. It went back in the bush. And now it's, it comes out of the bush, and it's right parallel, like right off my port side of my boat, 60, 70 yards in from us at anchor. And it's crouching low, but it's walking on two legs, but it's really crouching low. And Dean was standing by the side stay by the galley door. And I remember at that point, I made myself stand behind Dean and I kind of had the door open. I thought, if that son of a bitch throws a rock or a big stick, it's going to hit the side stay or by God, it'll hit Dean before it gets me. And I'm getting in there to get the 12 gauge. So I'm using my crewman sort of as cannon fodder for this thing in case it throws something. And Dean gets excited. He just goes, holy fuck, what the hell is that? And that thing stood up and you see the hair hanging off its left arm and it stood up and it just like, pissed off and it just stood up and made big steps. I went running through the galley up to the bow, hit the light on the spotlight, swung the spotlight looking out the port window and I got the spotlight beam on it just as it walked into the bush and he seen its right arm come up. It grabbed his alder tree and when it pulled it, you could see it was pissed off because that tree actually bent down like a twig. I mean, the thing had to be five foot diameter the next day when he measured it. And as it got on top of the bank, it looked over its shoulder and spun its body towards us and just grimaced and just let that tree go. And it kind of flip flopped a little bit, but not too much. And then it was gone. You could hear it walking to the slough. And then all of a sudden you heard that deep whistled chirp of its noise again. And then you heard the higher pitched one answering way back further in the forest. And that was it. That was the end of our about an hour and a half to two hour long sighting. And John Binder and the Eagle put it in his book, the first one he wrote. And it was one of the most amazing nights of my life. And as much as I wished for it never to happen again, I've had a couple other encounters, but we could talk about those later in another time or whenever you want. I wanted to ask you, and I wanted to get into other encounters, and I'd love for you to tell the uh, uh, logger the the guy in the logging truck that hit one because I was still thinking about that one after <laughs> you and I spoke. What do you think that these things are, Tom? What do you think Sasquatch um, is? Because they don't act like normal wild animals, and I say this all the time in the show. They do not act like they don't necessarily act human, but they don't really act like your normal uh, wild animal out there. Their behaviors are uh, across the board. They can be completely left field or completely right field. It, it kind of, you know, it's so hard to nail down their behavior. But what do you think that these things are? I think they're just a big gorilla. They're going to be, you know, I've, because of my interest, in it, yeah, I guess I'm a semi quasi researcher because I'm always asking questions and reading about it and, you know, hanging out with John Binderdagle for almost 20 plus years now, you know, learn a little bit of the sciences on it. You know, Gigantopithecus blackie, possibly. Um, the smaller one that's found in North America, and even our native people talk of a smaller one all through coastal British Columbia, actually all through Western Canada, I've found, you know, is it Homo forensis, a break off of that? Who knows? But, you know, the one thing is what upsets me is the holier-than-thou 
that humans have that or can't be something out there like that. We have internet. We can talk to spaceships of going around the moon. There's nothing out there we would have known by now. Well, you got to give the thing credit. You know, it's a creature. It's got five toes on each of its feet. It's bipedal. It's got two hands, big arms. Looks like a human. Is it a human? I don't think so. I think, you know, like Dr. Meldrum says, you know, relic humanoid or whatever. I don't know the sciences to define that other than it's probably a break from the human evolutionary branch. And then, you know, is it uh, Giganopithecus? Maybe it's both. Who knows? And then, of course, you got the ones that are contaminated with Christianity and other religions. And it's, you know, oh, God, no, there's no evolution. It was all created in six days. You know, get off your pedestal. These things are, you know, breathing, living creatures. And and I kind of think they're probably going to be closer related to a mountain gorilla from what I've seen, especially on my second encounter when I saw one, you know, face to face, not 50 feet away. You know, it's just to me, it looked like a big chimpanzee mountain gorilla. It had all the features that are, you know, that you find on both those critters. And, you okay. know, the thing just looked at me and grimaced, but it's, you know, that's what I think they are. Tell us about that. Tell us about your second encounter. I'd love to uh, get the details <laughs> from you on that encounter and what you saw. And were you out hunting when you, when you came across it? No, I built a sea kayak camp on what we call the Orca Corridor. It's Johnson Straits, eastern, northeastern Vancouver Island, where everyone comes sea kayaking and whale watching because all the orcas, we have killer whales. <laughs> so I built this camp, and it's just, I call them glorified garden sheds. They're 10 foot by 10 foot, made of red cedar. They look like a native-style longhouse, and they all have native orca designs painted on the front wall. And basically, it's just queen-size bed inside with a window on your foot and where your head is. And, two double doors that open up so you can see the cruise ships go by and the whales and beautiful place. And, and then we have a problem with tide. The tide pushes in this little pocket bay and it brings in all kinds of debris, all kinds of logs and sticks. As British Columbia waters, it's just, full, just like an asteroid belt sometimes with all the debris floating around, all the logs and branches. But anyway, these logs fill up my beach. You can't get in there with a kayak. So... I grabbed my two workers, native boy from Campbell River and this uh, young man who was Dutch, actually, who was my head sea kayak guide. We went up there in the pickup truck or in my tour boat, 12-passenger aluminum tour boat, and uh, my sister wanted to come. She's 10 years younger than me. I call her a concrete Indian because she's growing up in the concrete. She's not bushy like me. So she wants to come stay at my cabin. So we bring her up there and just in the late afternoon, early evening there, I grabbed a big power saw. And, you know, the power saws we use, they're separators. They separate men and boys real quickly because they're the biggest ones you can buy and 38-inch long bars on them with chain. And I go through two tanks of gas, cutting up all this driftwood on the beach. And, you know, I'm finished. I run out of gas on my second tank and sweating away. And I'm, you know, tuckered. So I put the saw down and I told my sister throw me a pepsi and she threw me a pepsi and i cracked it took half a can and my swallowed it and then i sat on one of those fold up garden lawn chairs i was just sitting there looking at the work i just did because my two workers you know they're helping me you know moving stuff around and then all of a sudden this tree above my cookhouse on a about a 15 18 foot high rock bank covered in about 15 20 foot high second growth uh, evergreens because it was logged about 20 years prior it starts shaking and it looks like one of those spook movies you go see about ghosts and you see someone convulsing where they're twitching faster than anyone can ever possibly twitch that's what these two small hemlock trees looked like they were just like vibrating like you couldn't believe and you could hear the noise so I looked up at it and my golden lab bush dog at the time his name was Land Claims don't laugh everywhere he lifted his legs as Indians were claiming it back. But anyway, <laughs> land claims, he's bushier than bush can be. Yeah. You know, he's, I taught him to spin bears. You know, it's a, what you do with your dog. You got to, when you want to get away from a bear and you don't want to shoot it, you get your dog, you just holler at him, spin bear. And they run in and they spin the bear until you get clear. And then you call your dog and they come back to you. So anyway, I land claims, get it, watch. And he goes storming up this rock wall where these trees are shaking and he gets to the top of the rock bank and he looks behind the trees and all you saw was his bush dog just spring. 
he just shot with his four legs and this went horizontal and dropped 12, 15 feet down onto the grass. And he's just this golden lab street going by me and my sister. That's not land claims. You don't do that. Yeah. You know, he's not trained. You're not allowed to do that. I'll shoot him if he's picked up a bad habit like that. So I'm like, what the hell? And all of a sudden, he, my sister, she's freaking out. And I'm like, settle down. And <clears throat> you heard this noise. And my sister, she's just like, what the hell was that, Tommy? And I'm like, get to the boat. We had a little dinghy and my 12 passenger tour boats anchored out in this bay, which is maybe 100 feet from shore. It's got a stern line going to its stern, an anchor off its bow, so it's pointing into the, if any waves come, because it was blowing that afternoon. And it has a port and a starboard line going to the opposite side of the bay. So my boat's tied so it doesn't spin. There's not much room in that bay. But I told my sister, get in the dinghy. And we'll go out to the boat, because I looked at one of my workers and I said, where's my gun? Grab my gun. He goes, it's out at the boat. I said, well, grab me an axe or a machete or something. So I'm looking at these two bushes that are shaking and all of a sudden this big boulder rolls down. And now I'm getting kind of concerned. I'm like, holy shit. And I'm waiting for my axe or my machete to come. And my sister's, you hear her splashing in the water because it's such high tide. She's trying to be Jesus walking on water and driftwood to get to the dinghy. (laughs) And I just said, okay, Tom, you got to be bush about this you can't just look at that one site you got to look at your flanks so i start moving my head to behind my cookhouse and there standing in the v at two trees is this big son of a bitch looking at me me and him just locked eyes and like i say he was what 40 50 60 feet away from me i don't know what the distance was but he was damn close i looked at him he looked at me and then you could see the muscles on his neck just tighten up and then all of a sudden this grimace these big white brownish chiclet sized teeth and he just made this grimace at me his face wrinkled up and i just right away i just thought holy shit he looks like a chimpanzee and that i'm like, sitting there going you know i mean i should be you know trying to leave meanwhile i'm sitting there going okay what do you see tom and i'm looking and i'm like color of skin i under i see the color it's grayish brown I see the wrinkles on his face. I see the muscles in his neck, his tendons, his eyes when he scrunched up like that. They all wrinkled up like someone who's got crow's legs or whatever you call them. And even his forehead had wrinkles on it like me. And then right away, I remember sitting there going, years, 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 years. So I looked at his ears and just like a chimpanzee, you could see the bottom of where humans have earlobes. It was just like a chimpanzee just rounded into the side of its head. And then all of a sudden, my sister started screaming, get me the hell out of here. And she's in the dinghy. And so I had this, my other two guys, they're getting their dinghy ready to go. And I thought, okay, I got to get the hell out of here. So I just backed up behind the house and didn't lose, take my eyes off them until the house come between us. And I turned and I walked to the water, jumped in a dinghy. And my sister was so shit scared. She damn near toppled our dinghy with my dog, my big brave bush dog trembling like a little mouse at the bottom of the duck punt. So I'm telling her to settle down. I get the bow pointed towards the boat and we start pulling and we're about 10 feet from the swim grid and my dog just takes off, just jumps, lands on his belly on the swim grid, his ass in the water, his claws on the swim grid and he's just tearing pain almost trying to get on, gets on the boat, goes into the cabin. I get on board, get my sister on the swim grid, and uh, I go into the boat to go grab my gun up in the in the forward bow area, cutty cabin area. And when I get in there, there's my brave dog trembling away, looking at me with this look like, boss, get me the hell out of here right now. And I'm just like, oh, you worthless mutt. Grabbed my gun, went on deck, and I'm telling the crew, cut the lines, cut the anchor off last, make sure the stern line's throwing clear of the propellers. And I'm just talking them through. I've started both my inboard motors on this boat. It's like a water, I used to call it my water Lamborghini because it was worth just as much as a Lamborghini and that thing went like a rocket. So anyway, I'm getting the lines and doing my commands and my sister's freaking out, crying. And I'm like, settle down, we're all right. I went on deck and then he heard it scream again over my motors. And I'm just like, get that bloody line cut. And they cut it and we started taking off slowly because I didn't want to tangle my props in those lines. And... uh Hugo, he's just bawling his eyes out, the Dutch kid. And uh, the native kid, he started laughing. He has no frontal lobe anyway. He's not too bright, that one. But he's just laughing. And uh, my sister, she's about peeing herself, 
my dog, he's not even coming out of the cuddy cabin. So I get outside to, off the shore a bit, and I go to my sister. I said, well, it's blowing pretty good. We can't go back to Sayward. There's a big ebb tide, seas of mountains right now. I said, well, let's go around the corner. We'll tie up at the logging landing on the booms there. Stay there tonight on the boat. She would have no part of it. So I took off. I don't blame her. <laughs> and I get about a mile and a half offshore, and I'm in like 10 to 15 foot holes coming off these big northwest waves and dropping into these big green holes. And I go to her. I said, there's Sayward. I said, we're not going to make it there. I said, look how big these waves are here. It's going to be worse over there with that ebb tide. I said, we'll go across channel to Port Neville and stay at the government dock. So that's where I went. The religious woman that lives there, I told her what happened. If she had a couple blankets, because I was worried about my sister. She was figured out she wasn't Jesus. She couldn't walk on water. She was pretty wet. So she gave us some blankets. And she even offered my her daughter's bedroom to my sister, but my sister would have no part of it. She wanted to stay on the boat because, you know, Port Neville's still bush. So anyway, we stayed there that night. Next morning, brought her back to Vancouver Island, and she went back to her concrete, and I don't think she's gone out to bush camping since. Yeah, I don't blame her. That's an amazing encounter. It's uh, I've, heard, I've talked to a lot of witnesses again that it, it reminded me of an encounter uh, that where I, a hunter had come across one, and he didn't want to come on the air, but <laughs> he was telling me about this Sasquatch he came across. He didn't know what it was. And he told me, he goes, Wes, I think it was smiling at me. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah, until I took a couple steps towards it. And I realized it wasn't smiling. It actually started grilling, uh, growling at him. But it was showing its teeth. It had its whole mouth uh, almost like a, a smile, but showing its teeth. And it's almost the same way you described it, uh, Tom. And he was like, what the heck is this thing? And it was actually growling at him. Uh, when you were like 40, 50 feet away from this thing, how tall was it? We measured the Next day, we went in there with a bunch of rifles and shotguns. We lit up the joint, let them know that you know I was peeing up higher on the fence post, letting them know I was my turf, not theirs. And uh, we went to where it was standing between those two trees. We measured it, and we got seven four to the top of its head from where the impressions were on the ground in the moss. Just impressions, not prints, but where it was standing and looking at us. It was seven foot four to the top of its head. Would you estimate a weight on this thing? Oh, it could have been like Leluska. It could have been a big body under that neck. That's all I could see was the neck up. Yeah, it's. does it worry you running into these things? Do you ever get concerned that, hey, this thing could turn on me pretty quick and there's really not much I could do but fire off shots and hope for the best? Well, it's like I was a hunting guide for quite a few years specializing in grizzly bears and black bears. Shot hundreds of bears, so um, I'm no longer a hunting guide trophy hunting guide anymore i'm just a food social ceremonial hunter and actually my son's name is kelaji hunter seawood means big grizzly bear hunter paddling towards a chief giving potlatch when it's translated to english so he's going to be 16 another next week and uh this spring and or fall i'll be taking him out to get his first black bear and his first grizzly and uh being a bushman it's you know i i say i've had three sightings of them but I've had a few other incidences of something. I don't know. Couldn't see it. So once I don't see anything, like you were saying earlier, you know, about the guy shooting a shotgun at a possible Sasquatch, you know, you don't do that. You know, you don't shoot at anything unless you know for sure what it is and you got a clean shot. So it's, I'm not concerned. I guess being a Bushman, I have a saying, you know, people always look at me, oh, you always got a gun with you. You know, I remember I worked with the sea kayak industry for years up in the Broughton Archipelago. You know, I used to tell them, you know, I may have to pack this gun around 10,000 times, but that one time I need it and I haven't needed it yet, I'm sure going to be glad I got it. And I said, and I tell them, where are you from? And they'll go, Boston. And I go, okay, do you have pit bulls there? Yeah. So if you're delivering Girl Scout cookies with your daughter or granddaughter and you come to a house with a picket fence all the way around it, just grass, a dog house that's empty that says beware a dog on the fence and you've heard from your granddaughter or daughter that a big mean pit bull lives in there do you open the gate and go ring the bell and see if they want to buy cookies he goes oh absolutely not and i said well what the hell would you do come come out to my bush for without a gun i said our pit bulls out here are black bears they're up to 500 pounds the bigger pit bulls are called grizzly bears over a thousand pounds they all got claws and they all got teeth and they all want to eat you and poop you out the next day I said, so that's why I carry a gun. 
So when I say that, people understand that who's the dumb one now? I'm the guy standing there with a gun. I ain't dumb. I do it for a reason. And knowing I have a gun when I'm out in the bush, especially with uh, my son when we're building that kayak camp, like I say, if I don't see it, it's not a sighting. Like John Bindernagel taught me, when in doubt, throw it out. Well, me and Land Claims and Hunter, my son, he was about, that would be 2005, so he would have been five years old. We were up at the camp, and I was sawing wood, banging nails, you know, doing my thing. I'm building a kayak camp, five cabins that look like a native longhouse village. Land Claims is at the head of the beach doing his job, his uncle in my pack. He's watching my, we still be doing my little boy on the beach. He's out there walking down lower and lower, knowing he shouldn't go too far, but he's pushing the boundaries because he likes picking limpets off the rocks and rolling up, and putting them in his pocket so I can cook them up for him, or else he's rolling rocks, catching baby crabs. So he's doing his young boy thing, and Land Claims is just sitting there keeping his six. I'm working away, and then all of a sudden Land Claims just stands up growling, but low growling, and his tail curls up, and he starts walking towards Hunter on the beach, and he's looking to his left up on the bush on the bank, and he's just got that low growl. And I look, I stop what I'm doing, and I grab the 30-30, and I walk towards land claims, and I go, don't worry, buddy, I'm with you. And he just starts walking towards Hunter real fast, and he gets to Hunter, and he's just standing there looking at the bush, beating on what he hears or smells. So I get down to where Hunter is, but I got my gun along my side. So, you know, in case it's a human, you know, it could be some yeah. guy out there going to put, look where he's going to put his marijuana patch for the summer or maybe some lost hiker or something. I didn't want to alarm them. I mean, nothing worse seeing a big fat Indian with a gun all of a sudden <laughs> scares anyone half to death. So I walk beside Hunter and I look up and I'm like, it's all right, Landy, it's all right. And he's settling down. He knows he can't chase anything unless I tell him. But I'm looking in the bush and I'm backing up and going forward, going sideways. I'm trying to see what the hell Landy's seeing. And all I could see was the brown of the end of the forest, but I seen a darker brown and distinctly saw long hairs. And I'm trying to look at that. And then whatever the thing was in there that was seeing me trying to look through the canopy wall, all of a sudden he just heard it. And it went up the hill and disappeared. To me, it wasn't a sighting, you know, it could have been a deer, could have been a bear, could have been a long haired hippie, you know, like I say, going to look for a patch to plant his pot. I don't know. But Landy didn't like it anyway. But right there, it, it kind of got my thinking that, okay, I think I got big fellas possibly around here. And I got to keep a tight eye on my kids because I had a younger daughter. I have a younger daughter, too. She's at that time she was crawling, so she wasn't up at the camp. But, you know, they we know that they're very curious, very interested in the children. You know, it's uh, north of Port Hardy on Vancouver Island's uh, place Christie Pass it's called there's a little bay on the south side called God's Pocket years ago I was in the water taxi before I had mine and going out the bush to go to work and I asked the captain I said hey I said you lived up in God's Pocket didn't you he goes oh yeah I grew up there so my parents had a homestead in God's Pocket I said yeah I remember going in there as a kid I remember you and your family your old farm was up there but you guys weren't living there he goes, yeah, no, no, we got chased out of there by the big fellas, he goes. And I'm like, ah, what happened? So I got up and went and stand beside him. Because you don't want to, you want to hear him, number one, motors are going, and you don't ever want the captain to take his eyes off the front window. So I went and stood beside him. I said, what happened? He said, oh, we had, you know, all kinds of shit was happening out there. But my uncle was across the pass on the island deer hunting. And, uh. This is the reason why I'm sharing this one, because it's so neat. It's a Diane Fossey, Jane Goodall moment. But he said his uncle, who's a bushman, was hunting. And all of a sudden, he smelled something. And then all of a sudden, bushes started shaking, trees. You know, when I'm saying trees, you know, yeah, some of our trees up here, thick as a vehicle, is long. But, you know, these ones were probably five, six inches thick. They were being shook. And his uncle got the gun ready to go in case something come after him and all of a sudden, something big just stood up and ran. But as it was running, it pounded its chest. And his uncle actually saw, he said it was like those African gorillas when they stand up and they're running, charging, pounding their chest. He goes, that's exactly what I saw, his uncle said. And he said, and that was the first 
really good encounter. We knew then we knew what it was. It was uh, bush apes. And then uh, he said, me and I was just young. He said, me and my sister and my brother were just youngins. And, but mom and dad had a rabbit hutch. And uh, whatever it was, was able to untangle, untwist the wire and pull the rabbit's heads off and take the bodies. And that's all that was left was their rabbit heads in the hutch. And that was another thing that happened there. And then he said, me and my brother and sister, we had another, like a guest house just below the main house. So it was sort of down a little bit of a hill. And it was dark and we were down there. We were allowed to go play in there. And we had, it was summertime because it was warm. We had the door open and the, my older brother was lying on the floor laughing because we were wrestling and everything. And me and my sister were jumping on the bed. And my sister just stopped jumping and started screaming. And I stopped and my brother's face just went like shock. And I stopped and I turned around and that's when I saw that big Sasquatch. It was so tall, it was crouched down looking in the door at us jumping. And then all three of us started screaming. And that's when our parents come running down from the top house and scared it off and went, took off in the bush. He goes, but that was pretty much, he goes, I remember that part of that story when he, I was years ago and I heard that close to 30 years and I heard that story but it gives you a good perspective of these things that's why I think they're more gorilla than anything grade 8 because they, the characteristics that you, you know them pounding their chest shaking foliage throwing things at you you're right it is interesting I, I've, I've had a lot of audio sent to me from researchers and and other people and I've heard that audio before where it sounds I mean I'll, I'll listen to it my my impression of it or how I translate it in my mind when I listen to it, I'm like, this sounds like a gorilla beating its chest. One of the things I'm interested in, Tom, is if you've ever heard of the chatter. Uh, people talk about hearing this chatter, hearing language. I'm curious if you've ever heard that. And when we come back tomorrow night, we'll be speaking with uh, Tom again, and Tom will be sharing more encounter stories, talking about if, if he's ever heard this chatter and what his take is on it. Uh, please go to hamumuadventures.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. I'll be linking to uh, Thomas's page. Tom, thanks so much for coming on tonight. And thank you guys for listening tonight. Hang out with us tomorrow as we talk about more encounters and more stories from the First Nation people. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Something that quite the lights on.